off like that. <laughs> well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the latest, latest evidence gathering session of the Kirklees Democracy Commission. Um, what I'll do first of all, go on, I just give you a brief background to why we're here and where we're coming from. Um, first of all, thank you very much indeed for sparing your time. Um, for the last couple of years I've been chairing a members commission which was designed as uh, an all party, small all party group, just to discuss issues around where we thought members may well be in five, ten years time. Uh, issues around member development, member recruitment. And it became clear that there were some bigger questions that needed considering. And that's where the Commission came out of that. Uh, we're all party, uh, slightly larger than the two you have with you this afternoon. Um, we've got a group that are present down at Bassett Law Council discussing matters with them. Uh, and I should also apologise, our independent chair, Andy Mycott from Huddersfield University, has been sent off to London for some reason, so he can't be with us. We've spent the summer taking uh, soundings from residents across Kirklees as a series of events. And then we embarked on uh, an intelligence gathering programme one of which is this session here today, which when it comes to its conclusion in the next week or so, um, we'll be getting the views of the political groups on the council and then going away and drafting that report. So, um, if I could first of all open just by asking you to just really provide the Commission with an overview of your work on asset-based community development. Sure. I started um, working uh, with asset-based community development intentionally about 23 years ago and then became more actively involved about 20 years ago, uh, very much working with um, the international leaders, which is the ABCD Institute, which I'm a faculty member of. And, um, so I worked in about 30, last count, but it's in excess of 30 countries around the world, from the kitchen table to um, parliament offices, and you get quite a, a varying view of what people understand the relationship between citizen and government to be, um, depending on the culture and depending on who you're talking to, really. Um, but I've continued, my main passion uh, is working at the grassroots level and trying to figure out how democracy grows from inside out and in a way that uh, is citizen-led rather than top-down. Um, so, you know, that, that's been the continual feature of, of my work. I had the pleasure of working in Huddersfield for the last two years um, and serving in communities like uh, Burpee and um, Clayton West, uh, and really as a facilitator, so quite distant, but really learning with uh, members of the local authority, local communities, what it actually takes to get people in a conversation where they believe that they're the primary inventors as opposed to passive consumers. And that's, that's a lot of what we're trying to understand. In the UK context, we are working in 12 uh, areas. Um, and behind those 12 areas are in total 60 neighbourhoods. So over the last seven years, we've been kind of holding, I suppose, a sense of our own democratic inquiry in a way um, and trying to understand what, uh, what it takes for people to lead uh, their own change uh, in, in an inclusive way at neighbourhood level. So there's a lot of learning. You know, um, I often say when you know one community or when you've seen one community, you've seen one community, you, you can't generalise. But it's very, very powerful to be in context, to be in a country. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around here. Um, so uh, I'm Irish, and, and I suppose we have, growing up in a rural context in Ireland, you have a view of community which is probably a bit rose-tinted. 
by comparison with a lot of more modern urban places that I've worked in. Um, but I think across the UK experience and then looking at what we've learned from the likes of um, Rwanda uh, to you know more practical stuff in North America, uh, you begin to kind of get a picture uh, of how people relate um, as citizens and indeed how you know elected members and, and executives uh, can contribute. So have you come across um, any experience of, of how Kurt Eads mm. has attempted to engage local communities and by local I mean have you had experience of that in your time? In, mm. Absolutely. And what's your view? Well, what we've seen over the last um, two years, Andrew, is just the really uh, immense desire for local people to get more actively involved. Um, and in many respects, it, you know, I think a lot of people work with the, uh, the assumption that people are apathetic, that they don't care, that they don't want to get engaged. Well, our experience in Clayton West and Berkeley is, is that people do want to get engaged, that more people would get engaged if um, things that get in their way were removed. Um, and that with skilled practice, with good community building, so instead of top down doing things to or for people, we actually started engaging with people like they were citizens, uh, instead of just treating them like clients that consume services. What we've discovered is this huge reservoir of people with immense passion, and immense interest, um, and the only two deficits that I've discovered in Huddersfield are uh, that people don't know just how powerful and how many assets they have at local level um, and the assets aren't as connected up as they could be. Now what I've seen over the last two years is when you've got skilled people who know how to identify, connect and mobilise those assets then people can use what's strong to address what's wrong very effectively. Of course they need you know, local government and of course they need support but what they also need is facilitation so that they can be at the heart of the conversation rather than just on their knees receiving services. And that's what I've seen here. You use the phrase removing things that get in the way. Is one of those accounts? It can be. It can be. Um, I think there's certain practices, um, certain bureaucracies, and certain attitudes that do get in the way of people feeling that they have something, you know, that they can contribute to the well-being of their community. And I think that's the critical thing. That's the critical, to my mind, the critical democratic question um, is what can you contribute to the well-being of your community and how can we support you? What's the limit of that and what can we add to that once you've reached your limit? That's the whole democratic narrative. How can elected members um, further facilitate that communication being more... I think, you know, at the end it's about changing the questions we're asking. You know, there's a bit of a meme going around the UK at the moment now that we should be asking people what matters to them rather than what matters, what's the matter with them. But I think it, it, it's really about saying, look, we're here to serve you, but our job isn't to be the inventors of your better tomorrow. That's your job. Our job as people elected is to support you with that invention to get you more joined up, to get you more connected. But ultimately, uh, we're not the ones that are supposed to be coming up with all of the answers. Our job, I think, is to facilitate you figuring out how you can be in a relationship with your neighbours and you can collectivise to come up with the answers and be producers, not just be consumers. So I think that the elected members that are really making a difference are the ones that are having a different conversation. They're not just... Um, they're not treating uh, citizens like clients, you know... Um, so I, I, I call the, the elected members that, that are getting in the way I think are the elected members I call the leave it to me elected members you know I'll just leave that with me I'll look after that uh, it's another vote in the bank and you know maybe the entire family could be good for at least three more generations you know um, so that clientelist model um, I think is, is, is gone effectively so there's still people practicing it but I think it's redundant Hopefully that's phasing out where hopefully. Hopefully we are missing that. Yeah, yeah. Especially when the new one's coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what about we've been doing a lot of public engagement and one of the things like I just mentioned about the elected members, we're seeing a lot from the public that we met we saw 
they, they do feel disconnected. And we've tried many a way, social media, um, leaflets, everything else. I mean, I know, just going back to this, but how much more, what, what other ways can we kind of try to do this? Is it more try this? Being yeah. Into it I, the yeah, yeah. Would be the I, I suppose the first thing to say is, is working harder won't get you to better. Um, this is not about working harder. I think the difficulty with community engagement is that before you can engage community, you've actually got to build community, and that's about building relationships. And I think that communities are like football matches where you've got 22 people who least need the exercise doing all the hard work and 3,000 people who most need the exercise telling them what to do. So engagement's a really funny thing for me because a lot of what it's about is trying to tell people come down off the turnstiles and play football. But they don't want to, <laughs> you know. Um, a lot of people don't want to volunteer anymore. Um, a lot of people do not want to go to meetings. I think if there was one word that described why humanity has not reached its full potential, that word would be meetings. So it's like we've kind of created a couple of narrow doors and we've said, you can participate in democracy as long as you volunteer, you come to a meeting, you know, or you sit on an advisory committee. But actually most people, I would say probably 80 odd percent of people, will not engage that. And they probably, you know, um, they may engage, some may engage online, probably more will engage online in certain age groups. But I think the reason people engage is because they've got a passion. They care about something. And I think, I believe, maybe more than think, that everybody cares about something enough to act upon it. The starting conversation needs to be, therefore not, do you want to engage in a preset agenda? Because that's what volunteering often is. is you know, will you come and volunteer to do something, a, a worthy, you know, predefined thing, that you can do as long as you, you know, get through the police check <laughs> and you fulfill the rules and you do the training, then you, you can be a volunteer. Well, actually, a lot of people don't want to do that. And then I think quite a lot of other people do not get attracted uh, by the proposition of committees. Uh, so how do we listen to people around what they care about and help them engage around the things that they want to do at the level they want to do? Um, and I think a lot of that is about getting close to people's doorsteps because most people engage around the things that are close to home. So um, it feels to me like we really need to go at the speed of, of trust. And I think elected members have an opportunity to do that because the ongoing relationships are, are there. But I think those ongoing relationships, we need to find a way of engaging with people, not just once every five years at the doorstep, but finding a way of almost having that conversation at street level. You know, what would you love to do if five of your neighbours helped you? How could I help you get together? Um, you know, it's almost at that level. And having the tea and biscuit money that enables people when a mum says, you know, there's nothing for 13-year-old girls to do there. Having the local intelligence that says, you know, you're not the first one that said that to me, there's seven others. If you, you know, if you want, you can use this parlour. Come next Thursday night, you know. And you can be, uh, you can be, you know, the deputised group that deals with thirteen-year-old girls. But but bring your daughters with you, and let's have a conversation. Or let's do it in your uh, kitchen. You know, if that's if that's comfortable. Here's twenty, thirty quid for tea and biscuits. Let's have the conversation. I think sometimes it feels to me we we, we use a lot of terminology like uh, how do we get people to the table as if the table is over there and that's the table that the citizens have to come to. And I think some of the conversations about how do we get invited to people's kitchen tables and how can we enable them to come to each other's tables to talk about things that matter to them that they will act upon. And that's a very different engagement question. So just finally on this question. I think that mainly the question that local authorities, and not just NHS trusts, uh, CCGs, institutions are asking people is, what's your opinion about what we should do to you, for you, or with you? And I think democracy is about listening carefully to what people themselves care enough to act on with each other. Uh, the opinions around services and interventions are important, but they're crowding out the conversation about what people care about enough to act on and to contribute. 
And so I think if we want to engage with people, we need to engage with them as powerful citizens with gifts to give and assets to share and not just passive consumers who give us their opinions about what we should do. Sure. Going back to your football analogy. How do we deal with the people who say, well, hang on a minute, I've paid my money to come to the turnstile, I want to watch you playing football, I don't want to go there. That's why you're there. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the people who, with some of the people in our uh, research have shown a reluctance to get involved because they said, well, that's why we elect the councils. So this is the representative view of democracy. Yeah, they, and essentially what they're saying, or on, on the surface of what they're saying is, uh, we don't want to participate. And I think that's, that's probably a pretty significant um, minority. It may even be a majority, I don't know what the head count is, but it's pretty significant. So people who've learned that um, democracy is a transaction, and that your uh, politics can get outsourced to members. And with respect to both of you, um, I think politics is more important than to be left in the hands of folks like yourselves. But I think we've trained people uh, to outsource their democratic franchise uh, and to treat it like a franchise. So we shouldn't be surprised when they play it back to us because for many of the forebears of um, your position have treated people like clients and um, many of the people who are paid to work at council level and third sector organisations, professions, have been very technocratic um, and very top down. The expert knows best and leave it with us and we'll sort it out. Um, and over time in a consumerist and individualistic society where people kind of think they, their good life is in the marketplace, it's not surprising that they'll start to treat their members, their pastors, their doctors as if they're the people who do their politicking, their you know, um, doctoring and their mediation for them. And to an extent, I think that part of the role of a powerful elected member is to actually say to people, eyeball to eyeball, whites to the eye to the whites to the eye, I'm confronting you with your own freedoms. You happen to live in a democracy, and whether you know it or not, or whether we've even fed into a counter-argument, the truth of the matter is, there are limits to what we can do. And if you want a good life, and if you want to have the community, and you want a safe community, you know what, you're going to have to pony up. Because the idea that a local government can unilaterally make you safe, make you well, keep you, you know, uh, away from all harms is a nonsense. And I think we have to have the conversation, but not in a neoliberal way, not in a moralistic way that says, you know, get up and do it for yourself now because we've run out of money, but one that says a good life cannot be determined by an outside agency doing things to you or for you. It's got to be worked out by finding a way that you can be a producer of your own life and we can support that. And I think some of it is about actually honestly saying the way we've interacted, the relationship we've had in the past, has not been a right relationship. And the way it's, in some instances, it's um, trained people in learned helplessness and dependency. And in other instances, the most active people can be is angry and disaffected and saying to you, oh, I'm the client, you're, 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 you know, you play the game or whatever it is. And I think we just have to say it's time to put a halt to that and have a different conversation. And I think that's going to be tough. But part of elected members is they have to dissent from conversations that are not democratic. I don't think that's a, dem a democratic conversation. I think it's a technocratic one. So is it a danger, though, that people will perceive that members are changing their attitude because there is a lack of money? The council is going to have to do it a different way. <coughs> we can't provide the services, so somebody's got to help provide the services. And it's the citizens. In the same way that... You mentioned doctors, well, they help relieve the pressure on the health service by making people aware that if they help themselves and don't get ill in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, I, I suppose the important thing now is, yeah, I often joke that there, there are two best times to plant a tree, 
One is 20 years ago. The second best is now. So there is no doubt that if people start changing their attitudes, that people are going to question why, why the change. And I think that it's probably fair that some of what has brought about or brought down the pressure on people to make it so that it is impossible to do anything other than change is fiscal retrenchment, austerity, call it what you will. The question though is what else and where to from here? Now from my perspective I think increasingly the people who are credible in this conversation, credible with members of the public, who are discerning and sophisticated and won't be going anywhere anytime soon. In other words, they will stay in conversation for quite some time and they'll be there long enough to work through the nuance of it. I think those folks will begin to be able to separate folks who are just trying to save money from those who have come to realize that the role, I think, of a democratic steward is to ensure that a person has the best possible life they can possibly have, and also civic life. Uh, and that's not about institutionalization. And I think the model uh, across Europe has been very much, we'll ensure that you have a good life by organizing our local government into a business and servicing you, um, which is another way of describing institutionalization. And I think, my, my own view on it is, is, I think we need to be saying to people that, um, we're not necessarily just doing this to save money. Actually, our primary driver, our moral driver, is because we don't think people should be institutionalized. We think that it is better for people to be interdependent in community life and have services when they need them, rather than to be completely dependent on services and have no community. And we think we've gotten the balance wrong. So we're not trying to, we're not doing this to save our system money. We're doing this to save people from our system. Systems need people's needs. Systems have been consuming people's needs for a long, long time. I recently met a man uh, in Huddersfield who was on his 22nd detox, 59 years of age, going through recovery. That's a long recovery. Uh, what's going on there? You know, uh, we've met people who've been in and out of systems like revolving doors. We've spoken in Huddersfield and Cross Corpies, we've spoken to agencies who are busy recruiting clients for their services but are not very clear on how they're supporting those people to get out of their services and back into interconnection and interdependent lives. And I think part of the democratic process is to challenge that and say that services are one thing but actually we want to see people having a life. And I think that is why, to be honest, we need to change. It's not just because the money is running out but in many respects because we've built up massive amounts of dependency and we've undermined the level of social fabric uh, at the local level. And that's what I think we need to be tending to and driven by, uh, right across the parties. You mentioned, you said across Europe, mm. presumably therefore you've got examples of how it's done differently elsewhere. Could yeah. you share a couple of those? Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many. I mean, in Portugal, for example, recovery is thought about completely differently than it is here. So in terms of working with people who are in a journey or on a journey of um, uh, recovery through addiction, um, the emphasis would be very, very firmly on things like income equality. Uh, so making sure that they actually have enough resource to have a reasonable quality of life. Um, issues of homelessness are dealt at the front end, not uh, after recovery has been proven. Um, really big emphasis uh, on how can we build the social network and fabric around the person and not just deal with the person as a unit of pathology that we're going to, uh, we're going to fix. Um, there are issues in Portugal, I'm not suggesting there aren't, but it's an example. In, um, in Sardinia, beautiful examples of where cooperative movements have, you know, one third in certain, um, Emilia Ariana, for example, there one third of the GDP of that region is generated by cooperatives. So a real strong ethic which says that, look, part of who we are economically is what we do together economically. Uh, so how can we network much more effectively? 
um, I'm going to do some work. It's not quite Europe necessarily, but uh, in Scandinavia, and in Denmark, and Sweden, um, and Norway as well, it has to be said. There's a real rethink around what we mean by public health. And so instead of thinking about, you know, it's smoking cessation and it's the 12-week nutrition program and we're going to refer moms to breastfeeding groups, they're really saying, hang on a second here, have we lost the plot? You know, it used to be that public health used to be about asking questions about the environment within which the person is. And how do we, instead of doing all of these programs, courses to people, how do we mobilize people to be producers of their own health? So all over you see examples, and I see wonderful examples in the UK as well, it has to be said. A part of me, because I travel around so much, I'm like a, an itinerant storyteller, I would love all of these best examples to talk to each other. Because in a way, I think what we're seeing is the net result of organizing our systems into silos in Europe for, for decades. And we see these almost spikes of innovation happen almost in spite of the silos and slowly but surely I think as money and resource and some of the hegemony of the system recedes it's possible for people to ask questions that before you just couldn't ask without seeming silly like why can't we organise by place or by neighbourhood as opposed to organising by all of these silos um, it used to be a couple of years ago if you said that out loud you'd be a little bit out there but now it's become almost self-evident, just that people aren't so sure how to do it yet. And that's what we've been experimenting with here in, in Curfews. How do you do that effectively? How do you... I often joke that, you know, silos are where smart people go to do dumb things. So we've got lots of smart people. We, they're just trapped in silos. So how do we liberate them? Um, how We know that neighbourhoods are a place where lots of different things come together. So instead of thinking about individuals as the unit of change, how do we think about the, the neighbourhoods where the economy, the environment, the, the culture can all start actually playing a part to respond to very serious issues? And, you know, the level of youth unemployment is very high here. Um, but we've seen today, I've heard some wonderful stories about how addressing issues of radicalisation starts with recognising that some of what we have to do is we've got to get radically inclusive about people who feel like they're at the furthest edge. How do we recognise them? And if it takes a village to raise a child, who's tending to the village? Uh, so, you know, the places where we're seeing best change happen are the places where local authorities are beginning to say, yes, we need to provide services, but we also have a role uh, a stewarding role to look after the well-being of the village. So we don't have a youth problem, we have a village problem. Let's get to the root of that first. And if we get to the root of it, the likelihood is we'll address a whole range of other issues. And so there's lots of examples around Europe of that. There's a lot of... It goes breaking down a lot of barriers, doesn't it? And smashing quite a lot of yeah. fiefdoms. That's right. That's right. And to an extent... You know, when you look at the, the, the scale of the challenge, it's, um, it's overwhelming. And so I think some of what we have to do is figure out how, how, we, go, how we go forward in a way that um, is decisive, impactful, but also it's, it's, go, it's going to endure. Um, so there's something about going with where the energy is. Now we know in neighbourhoods, for example, at, at that demographic, demographic uh, level of, you know, uh, where people live their lives at, at the street, at the family level, people are really busy, but they're also really keen to do bite-sized chunk pieces of engagement, you know, around the things that they care about, and they're motivated to do. Um, and there's lots of different ways we can make that easier for them. People want street parties, we can remove bureaucracy in the morning, you know. Um, people want to do something with four or five of their neighbours. There's ways we can make that a lot more practical. Um, it's interesting, for example, talk about engagement earlier. In New Zealand, more people, on average, engage. And that's you know across the world. And uh, one of the reasons that they do is because um, the insurance process in New Zealand is such that people have a massive amount of confidence that even if something negative happens in the, you know, in the process of helping their neighbour, that they're not going to you know, risk 
uh, sanctioned, they're not going to risk uh, losing their house as a consequence. So there's, there's a really very serious uh, underwriting by the state of voluntary activity. And they're also, one of the things I really like in the, in, in the New Zealand context is they make a very clear distinction between volunteering and neighbouring. Um, you know, so I cut my neighbour's um, garden uh, on Sunday morning, actually, you know, just because it was long and I did. I wasn't volunteering to do that. I was neighbouring. So they have a much more nuanced way of, 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 of talking about things. Um, so it just feels to me that, 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 you know, there's lots of those kinds of very small barriers that we could remove. In Seattle, um, what they realized was that only about 20% of civil society could actually get engaged, and they were the ones that had a constitution. Um, so if they wanted to do something that involved some cost, however small the cost might be, they had to become a constituted group, have a bank account, and so forth. And, you know... Seattle have begun to realize that that's not always necessary. There are ways that we can organize so that that doesn't have to happen. And I don't think they've gone far enough in Seattle, but they've gone pretty far. And since 1988, I think they've invested something in the region of $50 million in small amounts of money, saying to people, if you and a few of your neighbors want to do something to make things better and you need some resource to buy a hedge strip or what, whatever it might be, well, it, it'll be available to you. Um, and one of the things I love about what they've done in Seattle is they've said, but well, we're not giving that to you as a grant, you know, uh, or as a charitable uh, investment. We're going to give it to you as a match. So if you've got an idea on something you want to do, we'll recognize that idea by the number of hours that you're pledging as having a value of $10, $15 an hour. So when you come to us, you're not coming with cap in hand. You're coming with your $2,500 uh, dollars worth of sweat equity and we, as the state, as the local government, we're going to match that. So we're partners with you. And I think that's a really important renegotiation of the social contract, where people are, people are beginning to recognise, I am an agent of change, I do have power, I, I, I am respected, and I have some, some authority around this, and I'm being supported in that investment. Where could we get, sorry, no. where could we get, I mean, sorry, working within the communities and working... How could we get the community more engaged themselves in the democratic process and get themselves towards becoming our elected councillor? Mm. I personally believe that um, we, people our age, because this question is an interesting question. I, I would argue in the West, um, and particularly among very Americanized countries, that there's a very profound difference to how you'd answer that question for the 50s, 50 pluses, and the 35 minuses. Right? I think people 35 minus have had a very, very different experience growing up than people of 50 plus. Um, and so I think that if you were 35 or less, 35 or down, you probably would have grown up in an era, for example, when you you would have seen the demise of street play for kids, right? free street play. Um, you would have probably experienced quite a lot of child care by professionals as opposed to local people. You probably would have lived through an era uh, quite different, say, to um, even my era, I'm coming into my 50s, um, when I could not get away with bunking off school. I would have been caught my kids can get away with it um, and we're working hard as a community around that but we have to work extraordinarily hard so I think if we're looking for the ties that bind people to a civic impulse to the desire to be a public servant to contribute to be in public service I think we have to stop looking backwards I think we have to start looking at how do we support people to create those ties in the, in, the, in the here and now. So we've got to accept the world as it is, not as it should be. But we've also got to be prepared to create the world as it should be and not just accept it as it is right now. We need to do something from this standing start. And I think part of that, honestly, is about getting back into working at neighbourhood level, restoring the neighbourhood connection again. 
because that, to my mind, is the nursery of democracy. That's where the saplings of a democratic and uh, you know a public contribution impulse comes from. Certainly, where I learned it. Um, at the moment, uh, I worry, to be quite honest with you, for um, the future of democracy in, in the sense of how you describe it, and people you know who will progress to want to you know be um, to be contributors in that sense. Because so many of the kids, the young people who are coming through the process, are getting a sanitized version of it. They're not getting, you know, a, a real learning about having to deal with different age groups, dealing with the conflict that emerges on the street, walking through clubs and groups and the democracy and the political um, arguing that goes on there. A lot of them are just going on to these um, assemblies in schools and they're, they're learning how to represent their class. And I think it's fine, but it feels like a very reified, a very sanitized version. Or what we do sometimes is, is we kind of we work with young people through youth groups right, and youth programs, and we do maybe civic engagement or active citizenship training, and we even have civic classes. But the truth of the matter, I think, is people, young people, learn how to be democratic by being engaged with productive adults who are democratic who are contributing to the well-being of their community, who are figuring out how to live alongside people they don't like or they don't agree with and so forth. And unless we can repatriate that experience for our kids, get them out of, you know, out from behind screen time <laughs> and play dates that adults have organized for them, um, and really giving young people that sense of genuine agency and power, I, I worry. Because for me, I you know, engage regularly with young people around the world and they say, you know, Cormac, actually we're, sur we're surplus to demand. We're, we're known as youth at risk. And I don't think young people are at risk. I think they're at promise. But if we don't start investing in them and seeing them as leaders of, the, of, of today, not tomorrow, and giving them a real sense of the power of their franchise, the value of their contribution, um, then it's very hard to imagine where the next elected member is going to come from. What opportunities do you think would be given to be able to you know, literally do I that? think there's so many concerns. I mean, one of the first things is you look around Kirklees today mm -hmm. and you look at residence associations or you look at neighbourhood uh, watch. You look at kind of established groups or you look at the classic committee that's running a rugby group or soccer around here, right? Um, mm -hmm. And ask how many young people actually have a genuine voice in those. And the answer is not near enough. Um, who's going to ask some of those tough questions and say, come on guys, can we not create some space? But they may not want to necessarily occupy a seat, but at the moment it's really hard for them to even get that space. So I think there's a real opportunity there. And I think people are, people are good. You know, they may just need a nudge, <laughs> may need something. But I think that there are plenty of spaces within neighborhoods, associations, clubs, groups, where young people could have the opportunity to contribute, to get more civically involved. We're seeing it a lot in faith communities. Um, they're getting a bit better at that. Um, but I think there are other spaces where we, where, where we could. And really just being thoughtful and thinking, you know, are we inadvertently channeling young people to be just with other young people? Where are there opportunities for young people to be in relationship with people across the life course, contributing to their neighbourhood, and not just organising another youth program? Or you know, um, so there's lots of opportunities in Croydon and in other places. I've seen all kinds of innovation. And my favourite example of young people really getting an opportunity to think about what it's like to be in community life is a summer program where they actually encourage the kids in a ver an area of very high unemployment, they encourage the kids coming close to the summer period to interview all of the local neighbours who were in employment or were involved in contributing in some way to their community, could be retired or an artist or whatever. And in the process of interviewing, they encourage the kids to ask everybody that they interviewed, could they spend a day in work with them? or in their art studio where they're learning from them, being mentored by them, if you like, but also helping, being useful. So the kids went and spent a day with police officers, with 
you know, fire officers, with artists, with people who work on the bins, with, you know, with, with the whole array of people across the entire summer. And, and learn that despite the fact that they're in a community with very high levels of unemployment, they're also in a community with high levels of contribution, high levels of skill, high levels of passion. And I just value stuff like that so much because I see what that does to those young people. Their aspiration isn't just to get out of their community. Their aspiration is, is to be like the productive people in their community and to see themselves as having a future in that community because they see people who are, who are doing something of value and of worth. And it's not to suggest that people who are unemployed are not of value of worth. That's not, that's not my point. But really helping young people to understand that um, if you've got aspiration, it doesn't mean that you should just aspire to leave your community. But how do you serve we worked in Canada um, with the uh, Council for Ethics and Sport, and their biggest concern, uh, we worked with 33 uh, of the leading sporting organizations in Canada, and their biggest concern was the number of elite athletes, young kids, who were being trained to turn their back on their community, and instead of thinking about public service and the well-being of their community, to think about themselves. You know, and how they could be the very best and be elite. And a lot of the work we did with those those organisations is say, how do we shift that conversation? How do we how do we create an opportunity where if a kid is involved in sport, they see sport as an asset for community building, not just as something that's going to propel them to personal betterment. So I think this is a really important issue at a time when our kids are growing up and young adults are growing up. To you know, to believe in the values of the marketplace and individualism, how do we actually give them the opportunity to be contributors to their own community? And every single time, we've engaged with young people as contributors in their own community. They have absolutely excelled expectations. So I think there are lots and lots of opportunities. We just have to, I think, again, open up the conversation with young people. Be prepared to listen. No, it's nice. Um, it's nice of you to say it with with young children or with young adults, really. I mean, in my ward, I have two particular TRAs have been set up by youngsters, and they practically manage the whole Great. thing. And it's really good for them to come out and actually communicate with uh, uh, people from their neighbourhood. And it shows the community a different side. Mm. It's then wanting to get that tapped into. Do you want to do something more mm. in terms of let's get? Would you want to? get yourself elected, um, mm. would you want to go around that path? Mm. And they always send a secretary and say, no, let's stop the kind of work that we want to do because there's nothing really there. Mm. Like we, we've got more power at this level mm. and you've got no power when, you're at, when you become an elected right. member. Mm. So what would you say about that? Well, you know, I, 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 look, it depends on um, how people define power. I think power is often thought of as a zero-sum game where there's those that have it and those that don't. And I think in truth power is probably an infinite resource if it's based on relationship and it's a finite resource if it's thought about in terms of money and status. So, you know, I think that in a way I would encourage young people who are saying we feel powerful when we're connected and productive at the local level um, and I think you just trust the process. I, I, I mean, you know your own story and the story of how people got engaged. But often what ends up happening is um, radicalized is a terrible term, right? Because it's an, it's an, it should be extremized or extremized. Because radicalized is exactly what brings people from being an active member of the community to being an elected member often. They become radically um, thoughtful and animated about something often. Um, it's an issue, it's, it's, a particular, it's a particular challenge that they really strongly need to advocate for and they come to understand that the best way that they can move forward on the issue is through a process of having a constituency and a mandate to take it forward. Um, and they learn to understand that the only way they can keep that is by ensuring that that mandate stays robust and alive and that the constituency broadens. Um, so I think there are moments in time when people, it's almost like the, you know, the, 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 the caterpillar and the butterfly, when people move from phases. And I think we just have to be gentle and, um, and, and thoughtful about that. But uh, isn't it wonderful that young people are thinking about power 
um, and they're saying, you know, right now I feel I have power and I'm productive. As long as young people feel that they're powerful and they're productive, some will step forward to say, and one of the channels by which I can express that is through elected representation. Our enemy is not um, power um, or productivity, it's powerlessness and uh, overconsumption. How relevant is democratic legitimacy? It's absolutely essential. Um, not alone for elected members, but for people who are involved in public service. And I mean that to include third sector people as well. I think we serve the pleasure of the public. And though it's very, very hard to see it, um, you know, I, I really love that image, you know, where we're out at the edge of a cliff on a board and we're standing at that edge, that end, and the, the public are standing uh, at this. And, you know, you look at what's happening with policing in Baltimore at the moment um, with people of colour. And I'm absolutely convinced that what people are doing is through Black Lives Matters, etc., they're stepping off the board. And what's happening without the police realizing it is, is they're losing their legitimacy and they're going to fall if they're not very, very careful. So public service, I think, is something that's held as a sacred trust and, and, and our legitimacy is absolutely defined not just by how people participate in the process of voting, although that's hugely important, but also how they engage in civic life. Um, and like I said earlier on, that goes deeper for me than just coming to meetings, coming to committees, though it is part of it, or volunteering, and that's part of it too. So I think that it's really important, but the legitimacy is quite tacit, um, and I think in all kinds of different ways, part of what we're probably trying to do when we shift from just thinking about representative democracy to participatory democracy is making that invisible legitimacy or the giving of legitimacy to us more visible for people so they can really see their power, they can see their role, um, they can see the relationship uh, between go good government and bad government and active citizenship and inactive citizenship. Because often I think the difficulty is at either side of that, that boardwalk, people aren't seeing the link between civic action and public service. And we really, I think that's the role of members actually, is to really continually mind that gap and continually uh, let the experts and the technocrats know who serve at the pleasure, not just our pleasure, but the pleasure of the public that we serve, <coughs> and letting the public know um, that actually there are certain things that if they don't do them, won't get done. Not to keep them off the plank, but I'm quite happy about it. <laughs> exactly. You keep mentioning neighbourhoods, and at the start you said building from the bottom of the woods. Presumably, I mean, one of the things we're looking at is whether we as a council should be devolving power down to the neighbourhoods. Presumably you're advocating that the building blocks start there and we work up rather than... And we acknowledge that no one size doesn't fit all, no, every place has got different... Yes? Uh, how then are we do you think going to be affected by the fact that there's power being devolved down to from government to um, city regions and whatever elected mayors etc which actually is, is, is removing power from those localities power and influence mm -hmm. upwards and having an effect on the role of uh, district councillors because you know, there's going to be another layer above us. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's defeating the object of what you're suggesting. Yeah. Well, part of the difficulty sometimes is people take uh, courses of actions without fully understanding the philosophical base on which the action is predicated. So, you know, the, the, the notion of subsidiarity is that principle that no bigger unit, social, political, whatever it might be, will do that which a smaller unit can do. That's the principle. 
And then you start looking at all of the inconsistencies to that principle and you think, okay, they're using the same words, but the practice is really uh, is not in keeping with the principle. So in all kinds of ways, um, I think the real issue is about the relocation of authority. And uh, it's a, a long-standing issue with the human condition that uh, we hold on to power. And, um, and though we use re- rhetoric to masquerade the relocation of authority, we very rarely do. So we relocate responsibility. Mm-hmm. We might even sometimes relocate some money. But a relocation of power? Hmm. Um, so I think what I am really interested in is, okay, so if the idea that some of what we call power is being ossified or being kind of trumped up at the top and, you know, it's, it's, you need some crowbar to leverage it. Um, and that's one way of going. The other way of thinking about power is, is that at grassroots level, when people get more connected, um, when they get more thoughtful over a period of months and years about, well, you know, what is it we want to do to make our place the kind of place we want to live in? What help do we need from outside? And, and what are we expecting outside agencies to do for us? You know, which is a very basic way of describing a neighbourhood plan that's truly owned in plain language by local people rather than in, in language like the localism and stuff that people don't understand. You know, but everybody understands. Yeah, there's stuff we have to do, the stuff we need some help to do, and the stuff you guys have to do. That's easy. But to an extent, if we were in a situation where you know, populations of 3,000, 5,000 people uh, were able to be in conversation with each other, were able to say, you know, this is our vision for the future, and this is what we'll do, but here's what we need, you know, from the outside. Um, I think that would be immensely powerful. It would be an immensely powerful mandate for the people who were elected on the back of, well, actually, I am representing my community, and we've had a process of conversations where they've identified what they're going to do, and, you know, what, actually, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to hold myself and them to account for that to do what they said they would do. But we're also clear on the stuff that they want help with and we're going to advocate for that together. Um, and then there's some stuff that just outside agencies need to get on and do. There ain't too many communities who want to get busy you know, defining the curriculum for uh, gerontologists um, you know, in terms of how they get trained to be a doctor. But we've got to actually work that stuff up bottom, bottom up. Now, if at the same time we've got central governments and local governments who are actually listening to people, um, saying, okay, there's stuff you want to do yourself, and our job is to get out of the way and not stifle that. There's stuff you need help with, and our job is to make sure we're there and we support it. Um, Then I think we could do a much better job of relocating authority and power because there would be many, many more people holding us to account. Because I think, and that this is what you know is often happening in places like again I mentioned Seattle earlier on. But one of the significant things they did in Seattle was they set up a department of neighborhoods. So it was the first time that a local government organized itself the way people organize their lives instead of expecting people to organize themselves the way the government was organized. <laughs> you know, so it's a massive structural relocation of authority. Dug people out of jobs where they were just in silos and said, "Look, you've got a passion for community, come work for us." And what we're going to do is we're going to mobilize people who know how to serve community. Not everybody does, bless them, you know, uh, but know actually how to really work at that level. And we're going to grow power up that way. And then you, you don't need power devolved because by God, when you build that power grassroots, you hold those folks to account. And when you experience the nipping of heels at 5,000 by 55 or whatever it is, neighborhoods in Kirklees, and it's all a different proposition. Um, and I think that's often what's missing in a lot of the representative structures. It's all, you know, it's, it's, it's power in one way, but it's not another. Now, going back to your question earlier on, if we had that kind of participatory stuff going on, I think we'd see more people wanting to be involved in the uh, democratic process um, and right up to election. We would actually see that that would be an opportunity. Uh, further. But as it currently stands, it's less attractive. So there's a lot, you know, because the stakes are higher than, um, but I don't think that we can really get devolution as it's being described um, unless 
the power grows grassroots up as well as gets relocated. So the two things need to happen at the same time. Now that's why I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty certain that the local authorities that are investing in supporting actual community builders who know how to build that you know support communities to build that power, they're the ones that are going to really be able to get the best deal locally for their communities. Interesting. See, one critic's told us that, or more than one critic has told us that, in their opinion, um, the motivation for devolving power from central government down was purely economic. And that one thing that they never, have never done is consult the citizens, whatever, or even thought of how those citizens are going to be represented. And, and, and I would say it's not a devolution of power, it's a devolution of responsibility mm -hmm. without any power. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, 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 it's, look, it's the chicken saying to the pig, let's have a feast. I'll donate the eggs and you, don you donate the pork. <laughs> that's actually what devolution is. Um, it's, it's, it's that simple. I hate to be cynical, but <laughs> it's what we're like. Do you think that obviously those are the reasons why we have such a low turnout at election times as well? Absolutely. You, you know, and, and, and it's important to recognise that, um, for example, if you look at the, the turnout around um, uh, the future of uh, Scotland, and I'm trying to find a way of framing it that's non political, because there's lots of issues, but you know, essentially. Without the um, word devolution. I don't. <laughs> um, but you know, or, or, or let's take a less politicised uh, example. So um, uh, equal marriage rights. You know, um, uh, in Ireland, uh, look at the turnout. You know, um, so um, lots of conflict around how you interpret what happened in Greece. But look at the turnout. Um, so it's inaccurate to say that people don't care that people don't want to exercise franchise. I think what's probably accurate to say is that people are no longer relating to a partisan version of politics. They are no longer relating to the left-right divide. Because, look, here's the problem in a neoliberal reality, right? Whether you're left or you're right, you're in between. The reality is, is that the left and the right agree where it matters most. If I'm a poor person, I'm trying to decide if I have any power. And they agree that as a poor person, I don't have the right or even the nous to self-determine my own future. The only conflict here is that the left think I need to be rescued and serviced, and the right think I need to be pleased because ultimately I'm a, a you know, a, a rob the state. Um, but neither actually believe in the power of the citizen, particularly poor citizens, and that's the problem. So, you know, um, this howl of discontent from 17 million people, different sides will claim what it is, but one thing is pretty clear, is it's an expression of something which is not um, in any way uh, gilding uh, or, or, you know, covering in flowers either the left, right or in between. It's saying somehow the narrative, I don't see myself in the picture here. You know, and if all I can do is the politics of protest, you know, um, well, and so be it. So how do we give people an opportunity to see that the democratic process is a process where I as a citizen am at the centre of democracy as a productive person, as a person with assets, as a person with neighbours who can get connected up and can build collective agency, as a person who can influence things at a neighbourhood level, uh, at, at a borough level, and perhaps even at a regional level. And um, I think that really has to start with very small steps, because uh, that's how most people get engaged. You know, so how can we make sure the kids can play on the streets again in Kirkley's in safe ways? How can we ensure that um, we stop siloing people? You know, and aggregating older people with older people and younger people with older uh, younger people, and we get get people talking across the generations again. All of these questions need to be unpacked, but I think there's a simple starting point. I think the simple starting point is just get back into building the fabric of the neighbourhood again, getting people talking with each other again, getting people feeling confident with each other again, 
If we could do that, I think we'd have a foundation to build it. And that comes down to relationship. Absolutely. <clears throat> One of the things we're looking at is the electoral cycle, because here we're out in thirds. Um, and one option is to have all out every four years. Presumably, if we're going to create the model you're advocating, you would say to us, go for the four year, because it gives time for those relationships to build and develop. That's because you could start building a relationship, then a year later you have, you, you, you've lost your position. Absolutely. And tie it to, you see, what, what will happen is, is if people are doing neighbourhood plans, real neighbourhood plans rather than the analysis we've seen in the UK in the past around localism, real neighbourhood plans that are grassroots up, and they're recycling them every two years with the help of community builders at street level and also elected members who are really starting to get behind um, what it is people prioritise, people will start really picking out who's doing what. You know, who's doing the rabble rousing, who's, who's, who's playing partisan politics, and who's actually getting behind the neighbourhood plan, who's building connections across fault lines, who's mediating. Um, and I think that every four years would be a powerful um, way for people to kind of feel invested, and maybe even feel like, well, I could run like it, because I'm not just running for myself, and I'm not just running for my neighbour, I'm running for this plan which thousands of people have been involved in, which I have been actively involved in, which I believe in, and which I think needs some advocacy. Uh, and I think that's what's missing. But if that was there, uh, what you would end up with, I think, is um, much more engagement. Because people would be voting for what it is they prioritised. And at the moment, what they're voting for is individuals that they may have affinity for, uh, whose plans or propositions or advocacy points they may relate to or may not. But it's very hard, I think it must be extraordinarily hard for an elected member to understand and read the tea leaves and kind of gauge all of the different advocacy points that an entire diverse community uh, has. The only way to do that is to cohese it in some way. And the cohesing process is about mediation, it's about healing of old wounds, because community is messy, you know. Um, so I think you guys need support. I think the council needs to be saying, gee, why is it that we're going in and we're tangerinizing community? You know, we have all the young people in one sector, we have all the old people in another, and all the disability people. And we're going in and we're pulling our neighbourhoods apart, which makes your job incredibly difficult. And I think if I was in your shoes, I'd be saying to them, hang on a second here. We want to get our community strong, not pulled apart. Obviously, if people need services, we want them to get them. But... Where is the investment to actually build strong, coherent, cohesive neighbourhoods uh, across my patch, um, where people can plan together, they can actually think about their future, they can begin to take on the issues. And I think that's the only coherent way that a member can actually work across the kinds of populations you guys have to work in. And so that you're becoming advocates to the neighbourhood plan. And people can then decide you know, how good an advocate are you, <laughs> you know, and that's part of the, the process, and, you know, I, I know you, you guys are robust enough to kind of and resilient enough to, to go with that, um, but in the absence of that, I think it becomes a beauty contest, and it becomes a partisan thing, and often these days, I don't think people are necessarily engaged in that way, so we need to, not so much reinvent, but reimagine how we enable people to tell us what it is they can do for themselves what it is we can do to help them and ultimately what's left behind. It's reassuring to know that I've been winning beauty contests for over 20 years. <laughs> there you go. How do you combat the tension, if indeed it exists, which I suspect it does somehow experience in Kirkley's, of one area, one neighbourhood or whatever, pointing the finger and saying, they're getting more than we're getting. I think one of the ongoing difficulties you have here in Kirkley's, and it's not unique, is that the funding structures have tended not alone to pit community against community, but has to an extent pitted association against association within communities. So you'll see conflicts between football clubs and so on and so forth. 
Um, and we've done a lot to stoke that, you know. Um, so um, we have a lot of sense. So I think the very first thing that we need to do is to shift the narrative away from this kind of scarcity mindset much more to an abundance mindset. You see, what we're starting with every single time with communities is going in and doing a needs analysis. So we go in and the very first thing we say, you know, what's broken, what's wrong, what's problematic, and let's see how much lottery money, money or whatever we can get for that to fix it. And I would argue that the best way to disrupt the kind of narratives that you're describing is to actually start with the question, well, what's strong rather than what's wrong within your community? What, what's actually going well? What do you prize? What, what, what do you value? What have we got here? And how can we use what we have to get what we need? So many times, community, if you go and say to your community, you think you need a new community centre, yes or no? Well, it's binary. <laughs> You know, um, and some will be reasonable and some won't. It depends on whose backyard it's going to be built and so on and so forth. And you get into this endless cycle. But if we were to say to people, instead of talking about community centres, let's talk about where community gets centred and where the centre of community is in this place. I mean, for some people it's Weatherspoons, to be quite frank with you. For other people, it, you know, they have politicised questions like, why is it we've got schools that are closed half the year? You know, and when you open up those kinds of questions, it, it's not about oh, next door neighbours have got a community centre. We haven't. It's hang on a second. We've got all kinds of primary assets that are local and within our control that we're not using effectively. We have secondary assets that are local but not in our control, and maybe they should be. And we've got external assets, and we'll get to them when we've sorted out these first two. You know, and so you get a much more sustainable way of thinking about development of economic prosperity and of cohesion uh, and I think when you do that you get a lot less conflict when you start with the needs analysis instead of the asset inventory what you end up doing inadvertently is two things you pit people against each other for scarce resources and you make them think that the only way things are going to get better is if some outside expert comes in to make them better and that's where conflict comes from so I think we have to stop doing that Needs analysis, needs analysis. We've got to start with asset inventories and then figure out, because people can't know what they need until they first know what they have. And we haven't been asking people what they have. We've been making them dependent on external resources and then letting them down. Hmm. Would the world be a better place for our political parties? I think... We need politics. We need more politics. Not less politics. politics. What we need now to get to is a situation where party politics has legitimacy. And we're in a crisis because I think party politics uh, has lost its, or is, is very close to losing its legitimacy. Um, so the world would be a better place if party politics had more legitimacy and there are times when we've seen party politics have huge legitimacy in Iceland in res response to the banking crisis um, party politics across the floor but also uh, very definitely some parties stood up and took a uh, moral position uh, which was very countercultural, you know in the European context um, so I don't know I mean there are times when you see what's happening in uh, political life and you think, my goodness, just nationalise the government. In my own country, there were stages after the last election where they couldn't put a government together and I thought, you know, maybe an, a national government wouldn't be such a bad thing. Who needs party politics? Um, and I don't want to argue against party politics because I think to an extent diversity is hugely important. Um, I see party politics working remarkably well in the Netherlands sometimes and appallingly badly other times, you know, there's huge diversity of um, different parties. So I think that what I'd love to see is a pluralist society where parties can actually really begin to not just represent the various considerations and concerns of their constituencies but also have the ability to be peacemakers, have the ability to enable their constituencies to be in meaningful conversation and dialogue with diverse opinions, and maybe even opinions that are, are, are the polar opposite. 
And I think the difficulty is in a world where we have party politics that is partisan, that isn't happening. And that's the problem. So the diversity is the problem. It's the lack of the ability to actually celebrate diversity and to be in each other's company in an adult fashion. And of course, we see what's happening in the United States at the moment. And it's just, it's a parody of everything that can happen when you take partisan politics to the extreme. So party politics is not the issue, in my view, partisan politics is. And does that equally apply at the very local level? It can be, although what I've come to rely is at a local level in a lot of places is, is that for the most part, except for the bluff and bluster and the show, um, party politics doesn't play out to the same extent. I think that um, it does play out, no doubt, um, but it, it plays out less so. I think I've seen more collaboration um, at the neighbourhood level, and I think that's why I like to emphasise the neighbourhood. I think often the neighbourhood is a place that, you know, despite all of our differences, we can all agree on. Nobody can argue that a neighbourhood doesn't exist <laughs> once we agree the parameters. Um, and I think it's a place where everything comes together. So it's a place where agencies can get out of their silos and elected members can get out of their parties and we can get back into the spirit of public service again while carrying the best of the diverse views that we have. But ultimately, while these things tend to matter at local level, I think most... I mean, most people that I know of at local level who are members and are actually working at the grassroots and are accountable are kind of, they, they just have that connection to the cold face that I often don't see in regional and national politics. So they know uh, tomorrow night or tonight they'll be at a committee meeting. You know, they've got that kind of proximity to the street which I think at least modifies some of the worst excesses that we see in terms of partisan politics at the national level. So I've got a lot of hope for local politics, um, and I am hopeful as well for the new, I won't say new or young, I'd say the new practices that are emerging uh, among local members. I think local members are having to absolutely up their game and learn a whole new set of skills, but also they know that um, engagement at the street level, engagement, like you said, Andrew, it's, it's about relationships, and you stand and you fall on the basis of the relationships you have. So we're doing a lot of work with local elected members on that basis. Some of them are among the most frustrating people on the planet. But it is a mixed bag, and many of them are, are really gifted and could do a lot more, probably are doing a lot more than I do, to build community. So credit where credit's due and where their blackguards tell them to. That's my principle. Burbank, like the West, who um, Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think on that note, we've probably come to the end of our time. Unless there's any final message you want to leave with us. We've covered so much ground, and it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. And in a sense, you know, the only message is, wouldn't it be great if these conversations that we're having uh, were conversations that people felt they could have? in their local neighbourhoods across the kitchen table as well. And I suspect many people are actually, and we probably just can't hear them. <laughs> so maybe it's true to say that people are participating outside or beyond our radar, and maybe it's about valuing that too. I think ultimately it's about making the invisible visible. There are things happening out there that I think count as participation that don't actually register on our, on our ledger. And I would just encourage you to value them, to lift them up, to honour them uh, and actually maybe to make them visible because for a lot of people they don't even know they're not. Mm -hmm. I think we're trying to find as many ways as possible to be able to engage with that. Mm, that's great. I'll keep up the good work. Well as I <coughs> mentioned at the, at the start we're towards the end of the year we're doing our draft report and um, what we intend is that this won't just be a one way process that you've given your time to come in this afternoon and give us your views, thank you. But what we want to do then is distribute our draft to everybody who's engaged with. First, to make sure that we've interpreted what you've said to your satisfaction. Uh, and also to get any feedback you want to give us on our report and our recommendations. 
So if you're happy to do that, we'll put Carl will be saying no, okay. um, and then it will go to full well, full council early on next year and hopefully accepted. Uh, and the finished products will then be distributed far and wide for anybody who's interested. So mm. thank you very much indeed for your time. It's yeah. been most uh, most informative.